I've always been a real curious individual. I've wondered why things are the way they are. And so occasionally I'll come against a phrase that I just have to chase. I have to find out the origin. I have to understand the meaning. And one such phrase is there's more than one way to skin a cat. So I started to chase that one time when I was in high school, just wanting to understand where that came from, why that phrase is around. And what it speaks to is that there's usually, as you approach a problem, there's maybe one or two ways to solve that problem. And it doesn't really matter about the method, it's just the result, right? So um, the origin of that phrase, there's more than one way to skin a cat, comes all the way back from the French traders who came into this area and settled this territory. When the French traders were coming over in the 1700s, one of the things that they would do often is trap a beaver or a raccoon or all kinds of just different animals, mink, etc. And they would skin things. And there was this one animal in the United States that looked very similar to a cat. In fact, it had a cat-like shape, and it had this weird stripe right down the back. Anyone know what that's called? A skunk. When I moved to Illinois uh, in my very first ministry, the junior high mascot was known as the polecat. So when you would go to the, to the uh, mascot or to the school and you would be cheering on the skunks, there was this thing that was kind of rattling around in my head or in my nostril, depending on how you want to look at it, that I just went, what? That's so weird. Illinois has some weird mascots. There's also a pink bunny in uh, Illinois, but it wasn't too odd because where I grew up, my mascot was known as the, anyone know? The midgets, mighty, mighty, mighty midgets say, hey, hey, there he is, there's Dylan. I knew I'd get him awake at this point. But when it comes to there's more than one way to skin a cat, what it's referring to is there's more than one way to skin a skunk. That's really all that phrase means. But there are many phrases that we've come into that we just kind of accept as norm and we don't think much about, don't we? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by its toe. If it hollers, let it go. You are not it. I want to play a little game. <clears throat> Here's what I want to do. Some of you know this game. If you've ever... Um, been in a circle of friends and there's this thing that you have to do or that we have to do together you could draw short straws right you could draw straws and pull the short straw or there's a really fast game and it's not it right so I want you to turn around and the last person to not it is it all right so go ahead and turn around get in your little clusters and I'm gonna say go and it's the in the last person to put their thumb or their finger on their nose loses the game. We're going to find out who the slowest people in this audience are, all right? So get, get in your circles. I'm going to count one, two, three, and then it's a go. So if you need stand up, you need to interact, that's okay. That's way cool. All right, so get, get ready. Get comfortable. I'm going to count it down. This is, your, this is your opportunity to make fun of those that you came with to church. Are you two playing against each other? You and I are going to play. The three of us are going to play right here, all right? All right. Three, two, uh, just kidding. Ah, you guys are watching, you're not listening. You guys are watching, you're not listening, you ready? Three, two, one, not it. Wow, you guys are pretty good. You guys are pretty good. Do you know how silly every one of you look? I'm just telling you, some of you guys hit your eyeballs. I saw it. You tried to pretend it didn't happen, but I saw it happen. So I was in an elders meeting, not the one, not one from this church, and, and I'll just tell you who the church was. It was up in Kimball. I was up in an in a elders meeting in Minnesota, and we were talking through kind of the process about what our new minister should look like. In fact, while I was in Minnesota, I went through four senior pastor changes, okay? That's how long I was there, 10 years, and that was, that was kind of hard on us, just kind of not having a stable platform, stable environment. And so one of those transitions that we were going through, <clears throat> I remember the guys and I, we were sitting around, we are talking about what are some of the qualifications that we have for a senior pastor, for leadership? And um, as that question came up, you know, we circled the wagon. We went to the typical things like Titus and 1 Timothy and uh, even a little bit in Hebrews and 1 Peter 5 and different things that we just know biblically that's where that's at. So I just kind of changed the direction of the conversation with a question. I said... Okay, real quick, let me just ask you, what were your qualifications for your spouse? Did you have any considerations before you were married, the sort of individual that you were looking for? You know, had you ever considered 
what maybe qualifications, talents, abilities, you know, even physical features that you thought. And I had one elder in that meeting, he said, my only qualification was warm and breathing. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's right, Tom, because you're not a good catch. <laughs> that's right. But we had a good time with that. Warm and breathing was our qualification. And when you think about church leadership and church government, sometimes that becomes the qualifier. Are they warm? Are they alive? And are they breathing? I mean, do they have something to offer at all? And I, I guess what I want to try to encourage us to do is maybe think a little differently. We started a series um, uh, last week called Follow the Leader. And before I kind of dive into Follow the Leader, I just want to share with you why we're even talking about this subject of leadership, church leadership, church government. And the reason that we're even talking about this is pretty simple. We're in the season of nominating church leadership. And so I thought it would be a good opportunity for me just to throw some education to all of you who have come in new to Rising Sun. You're kind of scratching your head about this whole process. Maybe you come from denominations where there's not even elders in your, in your previous church. That's a weird term. That's like saved for the Mormon people, and you're kind of weirded out by that name. And so you're wondering, what is elder? So we're, I thought that this would be a good opportunity for us just to bring some practical education to where we're at as a congregation on this significant issue. So, elder, elder. Um, <clears throat> right now, where we're at at Rising Sun is we use um, elders, and the reason that we use elders is because we try to call um, things by Bible names. And so one of the names that the Bible has given us for people who lead us as a, as a congregation are called elders. That's what they're called, or bishops. Um, sometimes they're called presbyterius. That's the, one of the Greek words. And the reason that it's called Greek words is because, or presbyterius is because there's many and so we, we choose men from among our congregation, not as representatives like we do with the United States and, and the political government, but we do as just identifying things that we see in these individuals and we say, yeah, that's a person I could get behind, that I could, that I could trust, that I could really follow. And so in September, the whole month of September is dedicated for you to be analyzing those that you sit with. People that come to the church and, and that are invested in the church, you see they're contributing to the church in some way. And so we're asking your participation to help us identify future leaders in our church. And so this, the whole month of September is called the nomination process. And all the nomination process looks like is this. If I see an individual that I say, man, that's it. That's, this person has some fruit that shows that they are elder material, it's my obligation as a member of this congregation to approach that individual and say, you know, Mr. Smith, I really think... What I see in your life is consistent with scripture as an elder. I, have you ever considered being an elder? That's the conversation I'm obligated to have as a member of this congregation. And once I've had that conversation with whoever I think would be nominated or think should be nominated, if they've thought about it, if they've considered it, and if they would say, yeah, I've kind of thought about doing it too, then you can put their name in a little box that we have back in the information table. And so that entire month, we're just gathering names. That's all we're doing, just gathering names. M month of September. And we're asking your help on that. But you have to filter those names by things that are found in Scripture. And that's part of our task today is to kind of un unpack some of that Scripture and look at some of those qualifications so that you can do a better job maybe or do a, a thorough job at nominating. And then in the month of October, what we do as elders is we sit down with those individuals um, we throw their names on a table, we pray about those names, we think about, okay, are these consistent? And then we just simply do an interview and we talk about, hey, where are you at in life? Is this something that you're interested in? Because the scripture talks about how if a man desires to be an elder, that's an honorable thing, that's a noble thing. And so that's a good thing that they might desire, but maybe they're reluctant in their leadership. Maybe there's something going on in life that none of us know and they, were, they felt awkward about saying no to the individual who nominated them, so they're kind of... They, they, they don't want in, so we just do this little interview process that says, where are you at? Here's where we're at. And after we've heard from them, we share with them the direction that we're going. This is where we think that God's leading us, and are you in or are you out? And then after we've done that, we ask them about even their family and whether they've talked about this with their spouse and with their children and what that means. 
And so for after the month of October, we get into the month of November, and the whole month of November, we actually have filtered already, we've screened already, we've prayed already, we're asking the individual to pray, and then we throw the names back before you, and we've said, these are the individuals who have stepped forward after the process and have said, yeah, I, I would like to be considered. And we ask you then for a second participation. We ask you to help us screen those individuals, to scrutinize those individuals. We want to know what's going on in their home life, and their social life, whether or not you know, they, they fully understand or comprehend these responsibilities because, quite frankly, if these guys are kicking puppies when no one's looking, we need to know that, all right? That's kind of a weird thing. And so we got we to gotta know that these people are great people, and you're going to help us do that. So after they've been put before the names or the congregation a second time, then what happens is we go into a, a, a time of prayer. And if there are no concerns biblically for why these individuals should be nominated, when we come into our annual meeting in January, they're ushered in. They're anointed. Now, for those individuals who have never been elder before, we give them a full year where they get to just learn what eldership's all about. They get to understand our process. They get to understand our methods. They get to be trained. We ask them to read. We ask them to go to conferences. We ask them to really dive in and understand what this is. We don't just throw them into the deep end without any education, any discipleship. That wouldn't be wise on our part. So then after that full year of EIT, that's called, well, it's called elders in training, if during that year they've said, man, this is way too much, this is more than I thought it was, and it's, they, they're biting off more than they can chew, then they, with no, um, with no concern, or with no regards, or I'm sorry, with no, no awkwardness, they can say, this is way too much, and it's, it's okay. At least they got to try it before they got in. But once they get in, then we're asking them to serve for two terms that are three years apiece. That's our process. Aren't you glad that you came so far? You guys are like, wow, did you hear that sermon on church government today? That changed my life. I think I forgave my dad this morning. I know that's what some of you are thinking. It's going to be really tempting for you through the day to kind of go, ah, this isn't apply to me. But let me encourage you, if you missed last week, you need to go back and kind of check some of these things out. Because one of the things we talked about was that leadership is everybody's responsibility. Last week, we started, we introduced the series with why leadership that's the question we were trying to answer why is leadership even a part of our life why does it have to be something that we talk about that we think about that we process through and what we discovered last week was that the reason leadership is important is because leadership is about relationship it's everybody's responsibility to have some form of leadership in their life so leadership has to be discussed and so what my goal today is to try to understand what leadership is all about. But before I get into there, I just want to give you kind of just a, a real quick recap of what we did last week. So leadership is necessary because it's about you. It affects you. It happens through you. Leadership is everybody's business because leadership is all about relationship. <clears throat> um, principle one is that everybody has a responsibility for leadership, but what we discovered last week was that there's actually a second principle of leadership and that everybody has a different capacity of leadership okay not everyone has the same capacity we're all like light bulbs some of us are 60 watts some of us are 100 watt bulbs but then the third thing that we learned last week if you do, if you remember if you were here if you missed and I'm just kind of helping you kind of catch up to the conversation is that everyone will be accountable for by the same standards of leadership okay so whether you have a one chair um, sort of leadership role or a two chair leadership role or a platform role of leadership Everyone's held to the same standards. Now, if those are terms that you're not familiar with, go check out last week's sermon online. But today, my goal is to ask, what is leadership about? What is leadership about? So one of the things that I try to do when I, when I try to understand a definition or I understand a term is I go all the way back to some of the ancient things. And when I say ancient, not real ancient, but some modern history which is 1828 Webster's Dictionary. I love the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. It really helps us understand the evolution of linguistics. And so um, I looked up the word leadership in the 1828 Webster's. It's not there. Did you realize? I mean, that's, that's kind of weird that leadership is a relatively new term. And the reason leadership is a new term is because it used to just be called leader, right? Leader was a noun. It was a, it was, it was a person. Today, leadership is a verb, it's an adjective, it's something to describe, it, it, it's, it's evolving and metamorphosing right before us. 
In Business News Daily, Jennifer Post writes this thing. She says, leadership is, of course, subjective. I love that phrase. Leadership, of course it's subjective. She just kind of starts right from the very beginning that leadership's all, it's kind of relative. It's this loosey-goosey sort of term that it depends on where you're coming from and what angles you're looking at. But she writes that leadership, of course, is subjective. And then she goes on to say, but its foundation stems from one thing. And that one thing is this, the ability to teach, the ability to establish a following among individuals or teams. And then what she did, she went out through um, 15 to 20 of the top business uh, growth experts in the nation, and she asked them to help her define what this term of leadership is all about. And there are 11 different applications, 11 different responses on what leadership looks like. If I were to ask you what is leadership, I'm sure we would all come up with different names or different descriptive terms on what leadership is and is not. Some of these people said that the pursuit, leadership is the pursuit of bettering your environment. Others said that it's clarity, confidence, and courage. Others said it's helping others achieve their goals. That's what leadership's all about. I'm not gonna bore you with what all of these um, business writers came in and sub submitted as far as their response. But for me, that's the task at hand. And it can be a daunting task, it can be maybe a, a boring task, but I'm gonna ask you not to check out because I think that this applies to all of us. What I want you to do is I want you to think about, and this is where I need you to get back in your, in your little huddles here, okay, for me for a second. I want you to, those same people that you played not it with, I want you to get with, and I want you to answer this one question. What is the one word the one description, the one adjective, the one thing that makes leadership unique in your mind, what is it that rises above the rest? What's the one attribute of leadership that you look for in people that you follow? Go ahead and just talk about that for 20 seconds, go. <clears throat> so one thing you're looking at in church leadership. It could be church leadership, it could be corporate leadership, it doesn't matter what type of leadership we're talking about. What's the one characteristic that you're looking for that is just gold? That's what I want you to answer. Stuart, Valerie, I want you to get with the guy right in front of you. Right in front of you, yep, connect with him. So I can't plan for what I'm about to hear, but I'm just curious. I'm going to respond accordingly because I think intuitively many of us would connect with some of the same adjectives or descriptions, right? We would look for some of the same things. So what are some things that you heard in your circles that you think is, man, this is, this is the quality I chase. This is the thing I look for in church leadership or church leadership, corporate leadership. Go ahead, Evan. Courage and wisdom. Those are great attributes. Very good. Yeah, Scott. Say it again. Humility, huge, huge component of leadership. Yeah, Dan. Honesty. Yeah, Judy. Compassion or passion? Compassion. Okay, those are different terms. And I'm going to say your name. It's Linda. I'm just going to tell you it's Linda. Okay, anyway, they're a motivator. I called her Diane like two weeks ago backstage. I was like, what? Where'd that come from? Sorry. So, they were a, they're a motivator, okay? They're a motivator, that's good. I saw some other hands, yeah. Respect. respect, what do you mean by that? That they give respect or they earn respect? Or both? <laughs> okay, yep, sure, both of them, okay? Uh, I'm gonna pick on my buddy. Ability to show direction. That's really, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Integrity. So if you're an elder, these are all things that you should be writing down. Because these are the things that your flock, that your sheep are going, these are things that are like important to us. Yeah. They're a servant. They put on the towel. They wash the feet. They do the hard work. If he's chuckling, this is dangerous. Okay, I'm just saying that. Yeah, they communicate well. They communicate well. Yeah. They're confident, okay? Yeah. They're a multitasker? They can juggle? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yes. Okay? They're good listeners. 
which means it kind of implies, if I can take some liberty here, it implies that they also ask questions. They don't come to a conversation with the answers already because that means that they come with an agenda. Am I right? Okay. Character. Character. Yeah. That's rich. Phil. Strong. What kind of strength? Okay, so when I ask the question about strength, for those of you who are watching online, you're like, what just happened? Okay, so <laughs> Phil Johnson says strength, and I, when I said, what kind of strength? He said, well, I just got back from fishing, so everyone's wondering where he's going with this. And he said, I had to put on a leader so that when the northern or the wall I am guessing you went up north, okay, and I'm going to be there next week, so I'm excited to hear that story. Okay. When they come and they bite the line, they're not going to snap the line. So basically, it's that you have strength that when the hard time comes or the tooth comes, that you're not just cutting and you're not leaving. That's right. That's good. They're godly. That's probably an important person. Yeah. They're an example. So all of these things are rich. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss one? Paula. They're trustworthy. All of these are great characteristics and attributes of leadership, right? I think we missed it. I think we missed it. And I'll tell you, I'm being completely transparent, I missed it too. Until I started really reading and diving into the passage that we're going to look at, I think there's one thing that sets church leadership, and I know that I asked you just for leadership, but I think that there's one thing that sets church leadership apart from every other form of leadership. And I cannot wait to dive into Scripture and show you what that is. So why don't you go ahead and turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Now, as you're turning there, Titus is one of those books that Paul writes to his son. He calls him a true son. Um, it's right behind the, the Timothys. It's right around Hebrews. It's in your New Testament. Um, and by the way, I think that there's some, some ESV Bibles, some black cover Bibles in the pews if you don't have those. Oh, there, there aren't? Okay, we'll get those next week. Okay, but um, Titus is where we're going to be. Now, before we really dive in, there's a couple of things that we need to understand about Scripture. I love the story. I love the narrative of the Bible. I am Bible through and through, guys. I love the Bible. I devour the Word. It's sweet like honey to me, okay? So one of the things that you can see is sometimes you just camp out in the New Testament, but you miss some of the Old Testament references. For me, if you're trying to just watch or if you're just trying to read the New Testament, it's like watching a black and white TV. For you to really understand the full color and the full dynamics of the New Testament, you have to understand the intricacies of the Old Testament. The Old Testament points us to the New Testament, and so as we read the New Testament, if we understand the Old Testament, light bulbs start to go off. We're like, oh, that's what that meant. Wow. And so I want to share with you that in the Old Testament, there were some foreshadowings, there were some indicators that early on about what leadership was supposed to look like post-crucifixion, post-resurrection. And in Exodus chapter 18, it's a story of Moses. You can chase it later. You can write this in your notes. But Exodus 18 is a powerful story about Moses' leadership. Last week, I asked who were some of the best leaders that you are aware of in the Bible, and some of you even said Moses. It was the first thing that came to your mind. Why? Because Moses was a dynamic leader. He definitely was a leader that we could all kind of model after and see some attributes for or from. But in Exodus chapter 18, what happens is he has led the people from Egypt. He gets back into the wilderness area. And while he gets back to the wilderness area, he calls to his wife and his sons. And he says, hey, I'm back. Why don't you guys come with me now? I've already rescued my people. I've redeemed my people. I've escaped Pharaoh. Man, there's some cool stories I can't wait to tell you. There were like 10 things that happened that, that God used to convince Pharaoh to let us go. And I can't wait to share those with you. But get here. Come to me so that I could tell you these stories. And as his wife and daughter, or wife and sons came to him, so did Jethro, his father-in-law. And, and Moses tells everything to this Midian priest, to this guy that wasn't really even a believer. He didn't connect with God at all. He, he was just kind of this superstitious, supernatural, spiritual sort of guy. And he tells Jethro about all these things. And Jethro's like, man, your God sounds like he's the, the, the top dog God. And Moses is like, yeah, I know, it's kind of cool. And so then they continue to have this dialogue. And after they have this dialogue, Jethro watches Moses work for one day. And literally... 
at that big gathering that very next day, Moses takes his seat. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people just usher in, and there's people in a long line. And one case would come before him, and it would be, hey, this guy stole my puppy. Can you help me? No, give him his puppy back. Next. And so he was just basically being a judge for all these minor cases. Sometimes they were harder cases, though. They were bigger deals. They were like, hey, I, you know, like, Frank, he borrowed my mule, and when he borrowed my mule, he, the, the leg broke, and now we don't know, does he owe me the mule or what? And so Matt, Moses would really kind of scratch his head on some of these bigger cases. And Jethro pulls him aside during lunch break, it says, and he says, hey, Moses, what you're doing is not a good thing. That's literally what it says in Exodus 18. He says, here's what you should do. You should find men, and there were three characteristics and qualities, who would not accept bribes, who were wise, these are just like men full of the Spirit. Those are the men that you should pick. And you should have them be over people like tens and fifties and hundreds. And they take care of all the stuff that you can't take care of. And all the major things that they're, that's beyond them, they could bring that to you. That's a better way to do this. Now think about Moses for a second. Moses had just led these nimcompoops out of Egypt. And here my father-in-law is telling me what I'm doing is not a good thing. What are you talking about, Jethro? Who invited you to this dance? And yet, there's another story in Numbers that indicates the sort of leadership that Moses had. It says that Aaron and Miriam, that was brother and sister, they started to be very angry at Moses, and they didn't like Moses anymore, and they came to him with a charge, and they started to bring charges against him, and God calls them into the principal's office. He says, Moses, Aaron, Moses you go get Aaron and Miriam, and you guys get in here to the tent of meeting. As they get there, I think it's like Numbers chapter 12 or 13, it says that, that he reprimands Aaron and Miriam in front of Moses. And then there's this parenthetical note. Is it 12.3 or I think that's the, the, the chapter I'm in. In the King James, it says that Moses was the most meek man in the entire world. If you're reading in NIV what it says, he was the most humble man in all the world. So you start to see some indications of what good leadership looks like. Good leadership means that you're willing to follow first a certain path that has been laid out for you. That's one thing that we see with Moses. The second thing that we see with Moses is that there's some form of humility that he was teachable in his leadership. Those are great things. The other thing that we saw in Exodus is that there's really some strength when it comes to numbers. There's a great plurality of leadership that God has started to orchestrate. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2, David is running for his life, and as he runs to the caves of Adullam, it says, that there were three types of Ds that came across him. Three Ds. It says this in, in 1 Samuel 22. 2. It says people who were in distress, who were in debt, and who were discouraged. Who were in distress, who were in debt, and discouraged. And they gathered around David, and David became their leader. The other thing that, le the other leadership principle that we see in the Old Testament that's really not stated in the New Testament is that there's, there's no selection with who you get to lead. You, you don't get to pick and choose who you're going who, who to lead into battle. God chooses. You cannot have this form of hypocrisy or this form of judgment that you get to be selective on who you get. You don't get to show favoritism. In Zechariah 11, it talks about two shepherds, and God, through the prophet of Zechariah, says, man, some of you Shepherds are idiots. I'm going to remove your responsibilities. Hi, that's a dangerous chapter to read if you're an elder. All I'm saying is in the Old Testament, there's foreshadowing. In the Old Testament, there's a complete picture of what's happening in the New Testament. So let's dive into the New Testament. Okay? <clears throat> Titus chapter 1, verse 5. <clears throat> so the reason I left you in Crete... Let's stop there. The reason I left you in Crete, sorry, I had a little circle around the island, but I think it messed up our PowerPoint, so I took it out today. Can you dim the lights? So I'm going to try to point to it as best as I can. What you're looking at here is Italy. The boot is on the northwest corner. We've got Greece and the islands and the Aegean Sea, Mediterranean Sea. You have Cyprus, which is the first island that's up on the northeast side. But see this little island right in the middle? That's called Crete. Okay? So just for a a point of reference, I need you to understand why Crete's essential. Because what happens is there were a lot of ships that would come through Crete. They would port at, at its ports, and they would 
um, take some rest and take some, some time between getting to Italy or Israel or even Egypt. Crete was this mega center of, of traffic, it, but it was notorious in the ancient world. In fact, a common Greek word known as the Credizo would have taken its phonetic and even descriptive origin from this place, from Crete. And it, what Cretizo means is it, it means to be a liar or to be a Cretan. How would you like to have that as your description of your hometown? Oh, you're from Crete? Oh, you're a liar. That's basically what that word was. It was a common vernacular for them. Again, the point of origin for words is kind of interesting. But then what, what kind of made Crete a little bit more intriguing for me was that the god Zeus, many of you know that, that name in Greek culture, was, was said to have been born on the island of Crete. So they had this, this pompous arrogance, they had this attitude of pride, and they would tell heroic stories, they would over-embellish things, they, they had the, kind of this underhanded and this sly methodology about their, the way that they spoke. Their favorite subjects to brag about was how Zeus would come in forms of men, men, different men through history, and he would sleep with the women, and he would seduce them, and he would, teach, and he would tell lies to them to try to convince them to, to have sex with them. This was a, a horrific culture. It was a culture that you would kind of think just at first glance, Paul, why are we even spending any time with these people? If you'll look back to Titus, it's interesting when you know that part of its history, some words start to pop off the page. Let me go all the way back to verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Look at verse 2. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie. Man, right from the very beginning, Paul is attacking this cultural norm, this cultural setting that was accepted in their day. And Paul is saying, our God that we serve is very different than the one of Zeus. He doesn't lie at all. And look at verse 4. He says, to Titus, my true son. All of a sudden, as you're reading through the book of Titus, this idea of deception and this idea of lying and, this idea, and the contrasted light of truth is really exposed. These people were known for their treachery and for their greed. Many people who lived in Crete were mercenaries. They were hired guns. They, would, um, they were vigilantes. The island cities, which were dominant seaports in the Mediterranean, while they were popular, they were very unsafe and unsettling. They were very sexually corrupt. A lot of pirates would actually hang out in this area. It was not a pleasant place to be. And yet, in verse 5, Paul tells Titus, his son, the reason I left you in Crete was so that you might straighten out what was unfinished, that you might appoint elders in every town as I directed you. See, this was a significant island strategically for Paul. This would become an island that he thinks the gospel could really permeate from. Yeah, they were culturally challenged, and yes, there were strong people with strong personalities, but to Paul, it was the perfect place to set up shop. For the gospel you see sometimes we approach our culture today and we think all we want to do is run away we want to hide in our holy huddles we want to hide in our caves we want to pretend that the world's not there and yet the world that God has given us to live and to in interact with is the exact culture for us because we understand it we can speak to it we can be different in it so as Titus is supposed to appoint elders, there's really kind of three categories that he's looking for, and it's, it's divided in the verses. So verse 6, if you want to write this next year, next year Bible, you can. But basically what I've written in my Bible is Paul is telling Titus we're going to look at their home life. So let's look at verse 6. An elder must be blameless. Now some of you, if you're reading the New American Standard or the English Standard Version, you have a different phrase. It's above reproach. They mean the same thing. When they cannot be blamed for anything because of the way that they live. Okay? The next phrase, depend, it doesn't matter which Bible you read, they all say the same thing. The husband of but one wife. Now we've got to camp out there for a second. There are four main interpretations of what this verse means because it's caused a lot of confusion in church, quite frankly. The first early interpretation of this passage, husband of one wife, was that a man had to be married. If a man was not ever married, then he could not be an elder in the church. That was the, one of the earliest interpretations of this section of Scripture. 
They had to be married. A second interpretation was, well, no, he had to have been married at some point. So what the difference between that is, is that if he has to be married, then somebody who suffered death or divorce could never be qualified to be an elder. So the second interpretation kind of spoke to the first one saying, no, 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 it, it, the, the principle or the heartbeat of what this is saying is that at some point he had to have been married. It's not that he has to be married, but at some point he had to be married. But then you start to get into questions about divorce and is that okay for an elder to be divorced or not in our congregation? And so I think that there's a better meaning, a better interpretation that we're going to discover. The third interpretation, though, some people in commentaries, and I tended to lean towards this, is that what Paul was speaking to was polygamy. Because in this world, in Crete, it was very common for you to have multiple wives. That wasn't an odd thing, but could you imagine today if we were interviewing elders and we said, hey, can you bring the wife and the kids? We'd like to kind of get to know you a little better. And they say, well, which one? <laughs> I mean, it's like, deal off, we're done. Hey, we'll call you, don't worry. Thanks, Frank. We appreciate your interest. But the, the polygamy is maybe what Paul was talking about. I think there's a better interpretation. Literally, when you dissect this phrase, husband and one wife, what it means is a one-woman man. That's what it means. It means that as they're an elder, if they're an elder, that they are not somebody who is sexually promiscuous, they're not addicted to porn. They're not, they're not sexually parousing. They're not flirting with secretaries or they're not flirting with people that they work with. That they're not making inappropriate sexual lewd jokes. These are, these are people who, man, when they see their, their wife, the wife that they've been given today, that is their one woman man. That's what Paul's talking about. And that's my personal interpretation of what this means. So if you've ever been divorced, or if you've never been married, and you've wondered, I, I don't qualify, I'm going to kick against that. I don't think that's, that's necessarily true. If you've ever suffered the death of a spouse, and then you're remarried, you still are qualified. It's about the attitude that you have with your relationship with your wife. So then he goes on to say, uh, the husband and one wife, a man whose children believes. Now, if you're reading the NIV, this one, or the ESV, or even the New Living Translation, this one messes us up, messes us up a lot. But if you're reading the ESV, there's actually a footnote, and I'm going to ask you to go down to the footnote, because I think the ESV, or the King James Version, actually, does the best interpretation of what Paul's trying to say here. It's not saying, well, you, your children, your sons, and your daughters have to be firm believers. That's not what this passage is talking about. It means if, the, if you followed the ESV or the King James, it says faithful. Your children have to be faithful. They don't have to follow God. They have to follow you. And that would be, in my opinion, reinforced with what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because Paul tells Timothy, how can a person lead the church if they're not leading their home well? You know, it's difficult leading your home and having your wife follow you places that's maybe uncomfortable. Disciplining your children at times and saying no, maybe bending them over your knee and giving them a pop on the rear. Maybe that's a tough thing. It's really weird to do that with the church. Try bending somebody over the knee on the church and giving them a pop. It doesn't work. So how are you going to lead the church if you can't lead your home? That's what this is talking about. So Paul's asking us to really examine, dive deep into their home life. And when we hear a name of somebody of this caliber, our reaction shouldn't be, what? Why did his name up there? It should be, yeah, of course that makes sense. That's the sort of guy that we're looking for. Second thing that we're looking at is to look at their social life. And Paul dives into verse 7. He says this. Since an overseer, it's the same word, don't get um, confused with the term there, overseer, bishop, elder. Um, since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he is to be blameless. There's that word again. It's the same description. It's such a point of emphasis that Paul repeats it a second time. Guys, in case you're trying to put the scoundrel up, it does, it's not going to work. Don't, don't put him up here. It's not going to work. He's saying this guy has to be blameless. He has to be trustworthy. He has to be above reproach. So he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness. In other words, he's controlled by the spirit, not controlled by the spirits. And just a, a real quick teaching moment here. The Bible doesn't say that you, as an elder that you can't drink. The elder says you can't be controlled by drink. That's what it's talking about. Not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain, 
verse 8. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, one who is upright, holy, and disciplined. And so when you examine their social life, you're seeing how they show love to one another. And then the third thing that Paul tells Titus is as we're looking at their home life and we're looking at their social life, really we should probably understand what it is that they do. And this is that moment where I said, what I discovered this week completely changed everything for me. Changed the way I even was going with the sermon. Look at verse 9. He, the elder, must hold firmly, must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as taught so that he can give instruction in sound doctrine that he can rebuke those who reject it. You see, when you cut an elder, what, what comes out of that elder is scripture, right? When an elder comes against life, when he's going through kind of the pits, what comes out is he's, he's a walking, talking scripture, He's that guy that Jesus juice comes out of when life squeezes him. That's the sort of characteristic that we're talking about. But the thing that sets church leadership above every other form of leadership, did you catch it? It's the gospel. It's the gospel. That he holds firmly to the trustworthy things as taught. That phrase, as taught, is what kind of bounced for me. Because this isn't something that's made up. It's not Galatians 1.8 where some angel comes and gets to kind of change the ship's direction. See, what makes good leadership is being certain of the path that we're going, and being certain of the path that we're going is that we're following someone else. Who are we following? Part of being a good leader, what separates great leadership from good leadership is the ability to follow. What is that? How are you able to follow unless you know the path? Who set the path before us? Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when we follow Jesus, we're actually leading others to follow Jesus too. We're saying what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, as I follow the Lord, so you follow me. See, the path has been established for the leader. But the thing that they live and breathe is the gospel. The thing that they just die for, the thing that separates them apart from anyone else is the gospel. It's the fact that they're able to defend the gospel and also disciple others. It's that they're able to give their life, give their life in defense of the gospel so that others might have life themselves. You see, if the gospel's true, and what is the gospel? If, if the gospel's true, if the gospel says that God created us for relationship, and we broke that relationship with sin, but he came and resurrected that relationship through his death and resurrection, and if the resurrection's true, then I'm going to give my life defending that truth. So when I see somebody drinking water that is poison or death in their life, it is my responsibility as an elder to go before them and say, brother, what are you doing? This is going to cause death to you. That's not a comfortable thing to do as a leader. But that's my responsibility as a leader. Not only do I have to defend them maybe from their choices and their, and their, their own options and their own life, I have to defend the flock from outside predators. We're shepherds. Because there are people, especially in this day with Crete, that come in and try to distort the truth. They try to say, listen, that whole Jesus thing, that whole gospel thing, yeah, that's good, but... It's actually about works. It's about what you can do and what you, how you earn. And so for a great leader, they're defending the gospel to the point of death. And so Paul is telling Tim, Titus, appoint elders who are building into the lives of others by defending the gospel with their own. You see, I think every elder should be able to make an excellent leader. But I don't believe that every excellent leader is an effective elder. Why? Because it's the gospel that changes the elder. And the question for all of you and the question for me as I analyze what's been said today, have I responded to the gospel? Because how I respond to the gospel affects my effectiveness and capacity as a leader. Because if I truly believe that there is no point where death truly wins in anyone's life, I'm going to do everything I can with every last breath, even if it's uncomfortable at times, to push people to Jesus, to tell them about Jesus. And I will die on that hill, just like my Savior died on his for mine.
Father, thank you for the day. I pray that if, as we analyze um, just the season that we're in in life, I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment, that we might think about the men who are building into the lives of others, maybe even at the expense of their own life, that we might look to them, that we might follow them, that as they lead their homes and as they lead their lives in social arenas, that you would give them strength, that you would give them endurance. Thank you for their leadership. Thank you for all the great leaders that we're around, but Lord, I, I thank you so much that the church has different, it, it has a plurality of leadership. It's someone that we can get a lean on each other in times of trouble. I pray that we would lean on them if we're in trouble ourselves. In Christ's name.